Welcome to the San Mateo Arboretum Society's monthly seminar. Today's program is House Plants Frequently Asked Questions. It will last approximately 90 minutes and be recorded. A few days after the presentation, you will be emailed a link to the recording and an evaluation form to provide feedback. Questions can be asked at any time about the topic they are discussing. Other questions will be answered at the end of the program. For those viewing on Zoom, submit your questions by clicking on the chat box icon at the bottom of the screen. Before we start, a little information about what is happening at the Arboretum Society. Our nursery in San Mateo Central Park is open Saturdays and Sundays, noon to 3 p.m. Payment is by credit, debit, Apple, or Google Pay. No cash is accepted. Nursery is staffed by volunteers and may occasionally be closed. So check our website, sanmateoarboretum.org, or, or call 650-579-0536, extension 2, for updated information. While you're in Central Park, visit the Butterfly Hummingbird, Sun and Shade, and Rose Gardens. All these gardens are maintained by Arboretum Society volunteers. Check out the Rose Garden now. It is glorious full bloom. We're pleased to have Master Gardeners, Cynthia Nations and Cindy Morris as today's speakers. Cynthia's had a career in education where she taught second grade through the doctoral level students and was a district level administrator, a national education consultant in education technology and leadership. She has been equally active as a Master Gardener since 2015. Cindy has had an interest in gardens since she was a child visiting the Ferry Moore Seed Company where her father worked. She loved peeking into the labs and seeing all the experiments. The best part was picking out some seed packets to take home to grow. She was amazed that you could plant a small seed and it would grow into a wonderful flower. She graduated from San Francisco State and has taken many horticultural classes from different schools. She's worked as an interior plantscaper at a large forest company and now is a very active Master Gardener volunteer. She currently maintains herb garden in San Carlos Library Garden and usually leads the San Mateo Arboretum Monthly Plant Clinic. Welcome Cynthia and Cindy. Thank, Thank you. you. Usually when I'm not speaking, then I'm out there <laughs> um, doing a plant clinic once a month. So if you have questions, you can bring your stuff and we'll try to rattle through it. <laughs> well, we want to welcome you today. Um, First slide. We want to welcome you today. How many of you have ever heard of UC Master Gardeners? Oh, good. Okay. So what we are is we extend research-based knowledge uh, about integrated pest management, sustainable uh, landscape practices, uh, and home horticulture to um, the residents of San Mateo and San Francisco counties. Our particular Master Gardener program is um, integrated with, with San Francisco. So we have just like close ties. And there are, I think there are almost 200 of us now who have gone through the training and, and we do continuing ed every year. So we're, we're required to do certain amount of volunteer hours and uh, also continuing ed each, each year. And uh, we have projects throughout both counties. So it's very, very exciting to be part of this community. Being that I'm from Texas and I didn't know a soul and now I know really, uh, I have many acquaintances and friends now uh, having moved here in like 2012. So um, we want to welcome all of you. Uh, I could tell you about a little bit about this houseplant uh, presentation. We didn't used to do houseplant presentations. Uh, we just did mostly growing uh, veg veggies and, and maybe outdoor landscaping. But during COVID, there was a huge demand um, for houseplants because everybody was inside. We had our offices inside our homes. How many of that happened to you all? So all of a sudden we wanted to bring the beautiful outdoors in. in. So um, here we are. So we developed First of all, uh, this is our third uh, presentation three of three. We, our first one was basic houseplant information. You know, it was pests and soil and just the regular things you need to grow, light and, and water. Um, and then our second one, we really went into a lot of propagation. And then the third one, this is the third one. And what we did now, what we did back then, it was on a Zoom call. And when the people registered for the Zoom call, they also entered questions. And so from that, from all of those questions that we um, were asked, 
we've uh, like consolidated them. And here we have your house plant questions. And you all are welcome to um, ask questions during our presentations if you have something uh, you'd like to know or if something rings a bell in your own home, just, uh, just ask us. All right, our first question came from Lorraine and actually we just entered these first uh, couple of questions um, a few days ago. So uh, Cindy's going to take the first question. Oh, did you send it back? Oh, oh. Um, we're gonna talk about wandering Jews. Um, <laughs> maybe. Wandering dude. Wandering Jews. What I said. Oh, there is you said, well, it's wandering dude now because if you look it up on online, you'll know why it's wandering dude now. Wandering dude. Okay. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> yeah, there's yeah. a lot of names for it. And there's there's a whole history of that that I've read online, but we're not doing that now. Yeah, it's because <laughs> there was a traitor to Jesus and Jesus doomed him to wander the earth and da da da. Yeah, yeah. So that, and he was a Jew, so he was a wandering Jew. Anyway, um, we are gonna talk about this plant. Um, the question is, um, why are the leaves really fading in the middle of this plant? And why, what does she have to do to get it to grow um, more from the roots? Um, so first of all, this plant needs a good, um, it needs a well-draining soil. Um, it looks great in a hanging basket. Uh, give it plenty of indirect sun. It likes sun. Um, indirect sun, that means away from the window. Um, and it doesn't like to be too dry. So I'm gonna just a little bit damp water again. Um, this plant um, is old. I can tell that it's old. It, and it um, and as you can see, the growth is at the um, uh, tips of the plant. That's where all the growth is, of course. So um, she's wondering what she should do to make this look good again. Um, what I would do is cut the tips off and it's normal for a plant that's old to um, start fading by the roots at the lower part of the plant. Um, this wouldn't have happened if she kept it trimmed. These plants like to be trimmed. So you have a new plant and um, in, the, in the spring, you, you prune it a little bit and it gets bushier. And this plant I'm sure has never been trimmed. It's just growing. So what I would do is I would um, cut the, the, the tips off and propagate them and start a new plant um, and put them in the soil and start a new plant. Um, you, could eat, you could propagate them Nah, you might want to put them in uh, uh, a, a well-draining soil with some perlite and some compost, little compost and some soil. And um, I think you'll have a new plant. She'll have a new plant and it'll be very pretty. Um, and the colors will come back. I grow this outside. That's another thing you could do. If, if it starts getting kind of ragged looking, trim it up a little bit and put it outside for the summer. I'm, I'm big into putting my house plants outside in the summer. They really appreciate going outside because of course all house plants are grown outside. Nothing grows naturally indoors. So they're happy to go outside and get some fresh air, squirt them with the hose and they're happy except this doesn't like water on its leaves. So um, let's see what else I can tell you. Um, this plant could be invasive too. So, you know, you, you want to keep it in a container because uh, it wanders. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see, I didn't even read the, the screen. I just went off my, my own thoughts. That's great. So, okay, next slide. All right, so our second question from Lorraine, who is actually on Zoom right now. Um, she inherited this beautiful Schifflera about 40 years ago, and she's taken the cutting off the top a few times to start new plants, but she can't force new growth closer to the soil level. Uh, and she wanted to know if she could reduce the height of this without killing it. 
what I've done is this weekend, actually this just came, came about this last weekend and I did a little research on it. And it said the average life of a, you know, scientifically for a chef Lara is 10 years. But then I looked at a lot of other information and, oh, they're 40, 50, 60 years, and they probably look like this. So the first thing I would recommend is like, I don't know how long it's been in this particular pot. And this pot could be a little bit bigger than what it looks like in this picture. But um, I just um, actually on the slides, I've just uh, told about how you can do a propagation on a chef Lara with stem cuttings. And I'm not going to go into every one of these. But I also, uh, the stem cuttings where you take a cutting that's like maybe three to six in inches that has at least two nodes and you uh, put it in your potting soil and, and make sure one of the nodes is in the soil, okay? And water it. And it just gives you some uh, information on that. Also, um, you can uh, root in, in soil, just similar, but you just remove the lower leaves and dip the cutting in a rooting hormone and put the cut into the soil. It's very similar to uh, the other one. Uh, air layering is a little bit more difficult and I've, I've never, I've done it on an apple tree, but I've never done it on a chef Lara or any house plant indoors, but that's where you take a little slit uh, and you make like a little, well, I do a little B uh, into a main, one of the main branches. And then you take a cutting and you, you slice it off and you put it in there, you wrap it in sphagnum moss and tape, and then it eventually grows. All of this, uh, Cindy's going to tell you in a minute, anything time you propagate, it takes time and patience. So don't get, uh, you know, don't get too uh, frustrated because it, it eventually will grow because it's just wonderful cells that are just in there uh, taking off. Um, actually, I'm not real excited about rooting anything in water, although sometimes I do root things in water, but um, it, it, the downside is that the roots form and they're very weak. And when then you put them in soil, they might and might not live. Has that ever happened to anybody? Yeah, so water, you know, root, root cuttings, um, it's, it's a hit or miss to me. And then Cindy has some other information about a Chef Lara because she has experience with a Chef Lara because look at this, look at this, um, look at this long stem. So she's gonna tell you her experience. Okay. Um. Also, I'd, I'd add that you could do, um, you could take a propagation of this plant by, um, with the branch on the, the plant, you propagate right on the plant at the node with some uh, sphagnum moss wrapped around and um, keep it damp and you will grow roots there and then you cut it off and then you plant it. Yeah, that's the air layering. That's air layering. Yeah. The other was really grafting. Yeah. Okay, so I have this at home. I have several, and um, I got tired of messing with it in the house. I took it outside, I put it in the shade, and I chopped it off. <laughs> I cut it off, and I'll be darned if it didn't grow beautiful foliage from where I cut it off. So I would take this plant and cut it maybe uh, down to the second fluff of green leaves there and try to propagate the top part. Um, oh. oh, the yeah, light? The top. top. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Oops, no, not the top. Anyway, um, you can figure out the light. Um, and it will grow. So, and uh, I have several in my garden and they're quite pretty in the garden. Um, I have a, a chartreuse with the bigger leaves, very pretty. Um, I have um, a kind of a red and green one. They're very pretty in the shade garden. So that's what I would do. And definitely that pot is too small because you can just tell by the, whoa, whoa. Okay. There we go. We got a spotlight. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you could even cut it lower if you wanted. You could even cut it below that if you really want a fresh plant. So there you go. OK. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Uh, how many of you have ever had fungus gnats? Uh, not, not fruit flies. Fruit flies are the things that fly around your vegetables, but fungus gnats. Have you ever had that? Like a lot of you have had that. So it's very, very annoying. I've never had them like a lot. I don't, I don't remember having them that much, 
but my daughter had had a big rubber tree plant and 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 they were just flying all over her dining room and she was very very frustrated and since she's she since her mother's a master gardener you know she had to ask me so i really did research fungus gnats and so what's the best way to get rid of them first of all what are they so you can see these little tiny little flies crawling around on the soil and hovering around your plants hovering around your nose and face a lot and um, the leaves are dropping and, sh and shedding and there's tiny if you uh, if you were to pick this up out which we actually did on her plant you can see a lot of little white specks on the roots so what do you do oh that's okay so uh, what do you do um, with these fung fungus gnats? So first of all, with my daughter's case, it was such a bad case that we ended up taking the whole plant out, spraying the roots, and, it, and this is a tall rubber tree. Uh, and and we, you have to use a sterile potting soil mix when planting or repotting. And what I would do also, just as an added recommendation, is when you uh, go to a nursery, even though it's a very reputable nursery, I would go ahead and uh, isolate that plant because you could, even the best nurseries in the world, have uh, pests that you might be bringing in indoors. So I would isolate before you just kind of stick it in with all the other plants. Yes? I can show you another solution to this to make sure you put ornamental stuff back in for the soil and keep it back from. Like, are you talking about rocks yeah. or gravel or something? Yeah. Okay, um, that could help. The main thing is you don't need to water it much, okay? So that might keep it dry, but and, and that looks nice and everything, but it's, it's the best of all is to keep it dry. Uh, now, she doesn't even water her plant. Maybe she waters it every, you know, seven to 10 days. She makes sure that, that two to three inches down, and then she'll, she'll water it. Um, I not, oh, I did have that. Uh, check plants before you bring them indoors. Uh, and definitely overwatering. And we're going to say, oh, don't overwater your plants. We're going to say it and say it again, uh, because that is the main reason why we kill houseplants, overwatering. And then some people like to use those yellow sticky uh, tape. I've never, has anybody ever used that? Um, mm -hmm. Does it work? Um, I, I, I catch some. Oh, okay. Yeah. I can imagine if, if you saw that picture right there of uh, with the yellow sticky tape, that could be so satisfying, but I don't, I've never tried it, so I don't know if it works. I think it's auto, it automatically attracts the adults, but you still have to kill the larvae. Oh, okay. And then you kill the cycle. Oh, yeah, the, okay. The problem is that the gnats only last a day or two, but they lay eggs in the soil. That's why the rocks are good, because they can't lay eggs in, in the soil. Oh, okay. And um, so um, that's what you're trying to prevent. The eggs, those darn eggs. Yeah, those darn eggs. Oh, so at least it makes it attractive, right? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, maybe. Well, what maybe if it ever happens to me, I'll I'll try yellow. You could scrape off an inch of the soil too. Yeah, and that'll take your eggs out. Okay, okay, orchids. Um, Everybody loves to have orchids in the house, but people get so frustrated because they can't get them to rebloom. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about orchids. I have one here that from the Arboretum. If you'd like to buy it, it's out in the greenhouse. Um, the number one thing about taking care of orchids is light. These guys need good light. Um, I know you've heard that they, they're low light plants, but they really aren't. They like light. And the light um, is needed because the light that um, is the rays from the sun that are absorbed into the leaves are what creates the food for the plants, the starches, and that's what makes the plants happy and grow. And then it sends it down to the roots. Yes. But not direct sun. I put I mine have, in direct sun. I have tried them in my, my atrium. Yeah, it burns. Well, atrium would be hot, really hot. Um, I have them in south and west windows and it's sunny and they don't burn, but not, but not in an atrium. An atrium is pretty darn hot. So I um, forgot where I was at. Um, so 
light is really important. It's the number one thing um, to make your, your orchids rebloom. If you don't have enough light, it won't rebloom. If it doesn't rebloom, it's not in enough light. Um, so that's something to think about when it doesn't bloom. Um, second is the number one killer of these things is watering. People love them to death and they water. Instead of watering when the plant needs it, they water every Thursday. <laughs> That's not the way to water. The way to water is when it's dry. Um, this is in a heavy pot, so I can't really show you. This pot has holes in the side. That's for air circulation. The roots need air. And um, only water when they're dry, maybe once a week in the summer. Depends how many roots are in the container. Maybe in the winter, maybe once a month. Um, so don't, better to underwater these than overwater. Yes. Okay, this is, I water mine. I think about. Repeat the question for the Zoom people. How do you water your orchids? Um, I think about nature when I think about orchids. I grow my orchids as they grow in nature and then I can't go wrong. So orchids grow, this orchid is grows in trees or rocks or somewhere. And it has, it grows, it sits in the, on the tree branch and the roots are hanging over and it rains because it's in a tropical rainforest and it rains and everything gets wet and the roots are watered, everything's watered. Then it dries out and then it rains again. So I take mine to the sink and I give it, I pretend like it's raining. Um, I wash the leaves, I let the leaves get wet. Uh, I wash everything, give everything water. Um, and then I drain the center, tilt it a little. And, um, and then mine are very happy. Every single one of mine bloomed this year. So um, that's how I water. Um, let's see. Um, so fertilizer, soil, I use bark. The medium that it grows in is only there to hold the plant up. The medium doesn't add any kind of nutrition to the plant or anything. You can use moss, bark, corks, um, all kinds of things. I personally like bark and I like the bigger bark because it puts a lot of air space around the roots, but bark is getting more and more expensive and less and less available, um, our red, red bark. So the growers are using moss. It doesn't leave quite as much air space, but you can certainly do a good job of growing that moss. So, and then um, fertilizer, um, when the plant is growing, after this gets done blooming, a new leaf will grow. That's when you want to feed it a higher nitrogen because it's growing. When the leaf is grown, then you want to switch over to a higher potassium because the potassium will help it bloom. So that's, that's that. Um, repotting, you know, I belong to this little orchid group online and um, people post their orchid questions and I'm always amused at some of the answers. Um, most people bring their orchids home and the first thing they want to do is repot it. I don't know why, but they feel that needs to be repotted. When you buy something at the grocery store or wherever you buy your orchids, um, usually it'll stay in that pot for a couple of years. They like to be crowded. They don't mind it. Um, so don't repot them as soon as you bring them home and certainly don't repot it when it's in a bud stage like this because you'll get it so confused it might drop all these beautiful buds. Um, I think that covers everything. Does anyone have any more questions? Yes. Where do you, okay, so it's finished blooming and <coughs> where, where would you cut it back? Oh, to? good question. Free, you know? So you the when, where do you cut the, the orchid back when after it's done blooming to get a reed bloom? I'll say this about reed blooms. Once is good, that's it. Because this poor guy needs to rest. 
you can't expect it to bloom all the time. It's, it's too much energy for the plant, but certainly you can do it once. So you would go to the, you would go to the plant and you would look for a node, these lumpy things, and you'd look for a really strong one. Like there's a really strong one here. It's even starting to grow. So what I would do is cut right above that, a diagonal cut, and it will, it will sprout a new branch. If it doesn't in two weeks, then you need to go to a different one. If that doesn't work, cut the whole thing off. When this is done blooming and you're done with it, cut it to the bottom. Don't leave it there because you grow kikis. Does anyone know what a kiki is? A kiki is if you, um, after it grows, uh, sometimes before it's done blooming, um, these healthy nodes will grow. They'll start growing. Uh, sometimes they're so big, they have so much meristemic cells in it, which is the growing cells, that they will start growing new, a new plant, roots and leaves. That's a kiki. So people are totally miffed about what to do with that. If you have a kiki, it takes away from the plant below. Energy is going to this kiki. So you have to make a decision what you want to do. You either get rid of the kiki or you... you sacrifice some energy in the plant. Uh, people are quite enthralled with growing these kikis, but it'll take, you know, two or three years before it would ever bloom. You could propagate that way, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You have a new plant. Yep. Yes. Repeat your question, Chris. Um, oh, I'm sorry, can, are the kikis, can you use those to propagate for them? Can you use uh, kikis to propagate orchids? And the answer is yes. No more questions? Okay. Um, so another thing that's really important with growing plants and orchids, uh, anything indoors, is humidity. Most of our house plants are um, come from the jungles, um, tropical forests, and they're used to humidity. Again, going back to what, where they came from. And inside of our houses are pretty dry, at least my houses. And um, so how do we help them out a little bit? Well, we could do the pebble tray um, with pebbles in the bottom. Um, we have a dish under, thank you, Cynthia. We have a dish under, the pot and then a pebble tray under that, which creates humidity for the plant. We have a humidifier. Um, this humidifier is too close to the plant for my liking, especially since that's a sensitive area, which is not a high humidity plant. But um, you could have a humidifier in your room. Uh, that would certainly add moisture. And also you can spritz it. Um, spritzing is good as long as the plant is wet. Once it's dry, then you've lost your humidity. So I think the gravel is the best uh, choice um, in this instance. Next slide. So this is uh, my opinion about um, hydroponics versus soil. Um, Water roots, hydroponics, which is in this picture here, um, like Cynthia said, they're very white and they're very stringy and they're very fragile and they get all mushed together. Uh, my mother used to grow these on the wall with a, in a little um, violin, blue violin, glass blue violin by the doors. You know, I, I remember them and all, watching all the roots and, um, but they don't grow much because, um, um, they just don't have, there's just not enough nutrients for them to grow. Also, they develop, uh, high, they develop little side shoots um, and that's how they survive because you need, the plants need oxygen to survive around the roots. And so these guys have these little roots and they collect oxygen. <laughs> they collect oxygen from the air, uh, from the water, <laughs> threw me there. It's okay, it's just the window. 
Um, so they collect oxygen from the water. Um, and you'll find, as Cynthia said, you won't have as much luck replanting these if you're just starting them and then planting them. Um, you won't have as much luck doing that with these water roots. Um, the roots grown in soil or um, perlite or whatever your, uh, your choice is uh, for propagation, um, they're much stronger. They're brown and they're strong. They look more like, um, you know, spaghetti, how spaghetti is. And then there's the thin spaghetti. I can't remember what it's called. So, yeah, that's the, what the difference is. So, and the, the, the soil is, um, the roots are very deep. They go deep and um, they make a nice tap root. The water roots don't. <clears throat> so you'll have much more success with the uh, soil roots than you will with the water roots because people are always, you know, putting things in water. Yes, it'll root, but it's not really satisfactory. Um, so if you if you do do that, yes. When do you like add or change water? Because I have one of those that the roots are getting like mossy. So I kind of I rinse it off and make it white again. But then is that okay to stay mossy? Do I just have water? The question is, when do I change the water in my water vase that I'm growing plants in? And um, um, you have to change it frequently um, because... So it's not a matter of adding, it's a matter of changing. It, I wouldn't add, it's changing. You have to wash the roots off and uh, change the water pretty often because they will get green and yucky. Any other questions? Yes. Should you be adding liquid fertilizer or something? If you're growing hydroponically, should you be adding fertilizer? The answer is yes. But be very careful. Don't add very much uh, because there's no nutrients in water. Um, it'll survive without fertilizer, but uh, it's not going to ever get big. It's not going to get big with fertilizer either. It's not. Any other questions? Okay. Hey, yes. Um, so <laughs> if I'm rooting in water uh -huh. and I'm going to transfer it in soil, at what point do I do that? I would do it as soon as possible. So like because the more you have these hairy, stringy. Would you repeat the yes, question? sorry. I've been trying to remember. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> um, if I'm growing hydroponically, and when do I transfer into soil? Um, and the answer is I would do it as soon as possible because if you get a mass of those roots, I've done this and I've been not successful. You get a mass of those roots and they break when you try to transplant them and it's, you know, it's not great. Um, but if you do it when there's not a lot of the roots, so if, it, if it's starting some root growth, then I would put it in the, the soil and hope it continues. So is it like a measurement? Like, is it an inch or by time? Okay, an inch. <laughs> <laughs> yes? So how about like you see when you buy the store, they have bamboo plants and they're already rooted in water. Are they meant to stay rooted in water? And then but they grow so tall or and then are they meant to be transferred to another water container? How, what are these bamboo type plants that? So the answer is, question is, the bamboo plants um, that she sees growing in water are growing tall. Um, should they be in water, stay in water, or should they be in soil? They'll grow taller in, in soil. Some plants are meant to be in water. They have the um, biology to grow in water with these air roots. And um, that plant is, and one that does very well in water. Also, the anthurium grows, does very well in water. Oh, so if it's not the anthurium, I'm sorry, the spathophyllum, so the peace lily. The peace lily. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry. So if it's already very tall, does it mean it needs to be repotted into a bigger container of water? Is it happy? It's kind of straight, like it's tall, and then the leaves are at the top, and then the middle is 
that's that's the way the plant grows. So the plant is tall and it's growing at the top and she wonders if it should go into soil. Or a bigger water container. Or a bigger water container. It's only a small square yeah. right now, but it's super tall. Um, I've seen those growing in soil and they do very, very well in soil. Good um, She's talking about lucky bamboo. Are you talking about lucky bamboo? Yeah. Lucky Which we're talking That's about lucky bamboo, I think. And it's maybe crisscrossed and turned. And... Yeah, this one's not particularly, but, you know, the front here. And... Mm -hmm. um, I think that plant is um, an exception um, to, to other house plants because it does do very well in water. It's meant it has, it's a what it can grow in water. Um, like several other plants, uh, like lily, uh, um, water lilies and those type of things. So um, I, I think it might do better in soil. What, from what I've seen, they do better in soil than they do. They'll grow taller in soil than they will in water. I hope that answers your question. Yes. Mr. Cavazzo, don't plant it in the garden. I'm sorry? Don't plant it in the garden. It's incredibly invasive. Um, I've never even, it, that's the would we, would you plant, bamboo. um, would you plant a lucky bamboo in the garden because it's invasive? I've never seen one in the garden. I would never even think about doing that. And, and that's a different species. Yeah. That's yeah. A different... It's a different type of bamboo then. I don't even know if it is bamboo. Yes. Well, there's, there's invasive bamboo and not invasive. So. Yeah. There is bamboo that does not spread. Um, and there's bamboo that does. And now, bamboo and water, do you do the same thing, change the water and wash the roots off? Um, do you do the same thing um, with lucky bamboo um, as far as care? Yes, I would wash the roots. Um, though it might like the whatever's growing in the water, who knows? I'm not experienced with, with growing it in lucky bamboo in water, but. Sibi, I believe lucky bamboo is dracaena. So uh, it's not bamboo, it's dracaena. Um, oh, that could it. be. Yeah, you can grow it. It, it grows very well, as Cindy said. Oh, well. I didn't know that. You put it in a pot outside, but bring it in doors during winter. Okay. And yes, then I, I can also add, I had one in my bathroom for like eight years. And it was in a tall, thin one, and it had white rocks in it. And I had that in there. It lasted, and I did change it because these little red roots kept growing at the bottom. And uh, I always, you know, filled it up with water again, or I emptied it out, out and put fresh water in there. And I didn't want it to grow bigger. I just wanted it to be nice in my bathroom to have something green in there. So um, that's what I did, and it lasted for eight years. Mm -hmm. so. Well, that's very interesting. I did not know it was a, was a dracaena, which also is a cane plant with leaves. Um, so a dracaena would definitely do better in soil than in water if you want it to grow. If you want to keep it the same that it is, then water is fine. Though a dracaena does not, I would never grow a dracaena plant in water because um, they have a lot of water in the canes. So that's another whole thing. Okay. Okay. I see. All right. So who is very familiar with NPK fertilizers? You go to the store and there's like a whole shelf full of uh, fertilizers and you see three, five, seven, you see two, 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 you see so many things. Does anybody know? Has anybody, I didn't know until I became a master gardener what NPK was. So I'll just tell you that um, all of these fertilizers, uh, they have three primary nutrients. N, nitrogen, P, phosphorus, and uh, K, uh, uh, potassium? Yes. Potassium. Yeah. Okay. So if you're higher in P, it's phosphorus. So I have that example up there that uh, if the middle number, I have 131, that means NPK, it's higher in phosphorus and it's good for flowering, all right? And I'm gonna show you a little chart uh, on the next slide. So if it's N, it's higher in uh, nitrogen 
uh, for green plants that typically don't produce flowers. So I have the example of 533, so the N is higher. And then you also have a lot of secondary uh, nutrients uh, with uh, like calcium and magnesium. And there's even like micronutrients that are, are lesser, uh, like calcium, iron, zinc, boron. There's a lot of those. So you can look at that. But the NPK is the most important thing. I don't know why this thing is not doing well. <laughs> All right. So in order to give you like a better visual of NPK, so that you'll know what you're, you know, you're looking for. Uh, I said uh, nitrogen again, fo foliage, think of your leaves. Uh, you know, it's just great. I remember though, one time I could give you an example of not a house plant. I, uh, I, I grow my yearly tomatoes in uh, big grow bags. And uh, last year, actually, this is what happened. I put a lot of um, alfalfa pellets, which are, are, are um, plant-based and it, it loads up the, the plants uh, with nitrogen. And I happened with all my compost and my great little soil mixture for the tomatoes, I um, actually probably put too much uh, alfalfa pellets in there, which is nitrogen. And you know what? I didn't get very many, many tomatoes in those bags. So it was kind of like an experiment for me. Your so, plant was too busy growing. It, it was too busy. Yeah. It the, couldn't the set fruit because it was too busy growing. Yeah. And believe me, they were, well, they were at the top of my greenhouse. I live in Half Moon Bay yeah. and I grow in a greenhouse. So it's like, they were very, very large. No alfalfa pellets this year. <laughs> okay. Phosphorus. <clears throat> if you have that, if you want to uh, grow flowers, you know, anything with, with flowers, it's phosphorus. So that middle number is a uh, high one, three, one, and you'll see two, seven, three. I, and I don't know all of these combinations and I really don't know why they have all of those different kinds. Do you, do you know? I think just to sell the fertilizer. Personally. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. And so yeah, they have it for bonsai. They have it for maples. They have it, right. they have it for everything. Yeah. So they're, you know, with commercial. Mm. So higher in potassium, K is potassium. If you remember high school, uh, high school uh, chemistry. Uh, it encourages a stronger plant, a stronger root system. So NPK, yes. So when you said your tomatoes then, uh, is that flowering, so it should be higher in P? You know, with my tomatoes, I use, it's kind of like a, a marine-based, I can't, you know, like any marine-based liquid, um, I use that. I First of all, I use very good soil, a lot of good compost. I happen to work a lot or volunteer a lot at Elkis Ranch in Half Moon Bay. So there's a lot of good compost there that I'm able to bring home. Or, you know, there are different places you can uh, get good fertile, um, good compost. Think, what do you use? I think, well- She's an, a tomato expert, by the way. <laughs> oh, I, the question is, what was the question? Yeah, for as far as all this, for phosphorus, is tomato considered flowering and therefore does it need more phosphorus? Does the need tomato need more phosphorus because it flowers? I would feed my tomato a well-balanced fertilizer because it needs everything. It needs to grow, it needs to set fruit, and it needs to have good roots. Um, it's not like the orchid where you, you know, at one period it's growing and then it's going to set flower. Uh, the tomato grows and sets flower at the same time. So, And right now it's kind of like um, really good flowering se season for tomatoes. So I, I do use that marine based liquid and I'm going to uh, tell talk to you about that uh, right now. Um, she overloves her tomatoes. <laughs> yes, I, I love my tomatoes. Um, so look for uh, the fertilizers that contain the macro and micronutrients and they're not chemically based. That's why I use the marine based. You know, it's, I, I don't know what's in this formula that I use, it's liquid and you can buy it concentrate. And then I just water, you know, put it in there probably during the growing season, maybe every three weeks. Not, not a lot because I've already, I already have good compost in there. She's talking about uh, um, fish emulsion and seaweed emulsion, that kind of stuff. Marine, right? Yes, marine base. Yes. Yeah, marine base. And so anything that is blue, it's chemical base. And we recommend highly not to use anything. It might make... I remember uh, somebody saying that uh, that blue stuff is like uh, plants on steroids. You get like a big uh, boost of really good uh, growth. And then all of a sudden it's not that healthy after that. You know, it's like if you're on drugs, uh, you have to keep on 
whatever you do with, with you know. They especially uh, push that for the orchids. There's all kinds of stages of fertilizer. One's pink, one's blue, one's green. They all do something different. Yes. Since you have the leafy plant up there, I wonder how often and what's the best reason to water it? Okay, uh, we're going to talk. Well, I can just tell you now. Uh, actually, that's a, the picture. Oh, what is the best way to take care of a ZZ plant? Um, you know, um, ZZ plants are very, very popular due to the fact that they hardly need any sunlight and they don't uh, need any very, very little water. Um, we might, might have uh, between my little space and my, my daughter's uh, family space, we might have about five ZZ plants. They're in my grandchildren's bedroom because they're never going to take care of it. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm the one to take care of all the plants. And um, they grow with no light. They grow, they no. just grow. They're they just need one some light. Well, some light, very low, <laughs> low light. Actually, we're gonna look at some low light house plants, but they need some light, um, but they will grow amazingly. I've seen them in a library. So is it better to like water it down once a week and let, let it stay? Once water once when it's sorry, dry. Once, yeah. Right, I once week. A week it Yeah, the question is, is it better to water once a week or, or whatever? Um, and, and we say water it when it's dry. So you can stick your finger down in it. Like right now I can feel, this one doesn't need watering, you know, cause I feel a little bit of moisture. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, um, you know, it's, it's just a wonderful Zamiococcus zamifolia. I can always love that, that sound. <laughs> okay, yes. In the uh, range of house plants you showed so far, is there a preference to which room in the house you put them in? Do you know, like prefer the kitchen? Or do they like uh, uh, things like that involve like TV sound in the background? Is that healthy for them? <laughs> <laughs> or is there a preference to a room in the house? Depends the where the light is. Oh, right. Uh, I think it. Um, the question is, uh, is there a preferential place in your home to put a house plant? Um, a ZZ plant grows in my grandson's bedroom where he has a full drum set. Doesn't hurt it. All right, so none of the noise and all of that hurts it. It depends on the light and, and, and the water and, and very infrequent watering. I can tell you, I don't have a certain day that I water my houseplants. I water when it's dry. I water by actually appearance. You know, I don't even have to look. I can just like, I can tell. I can tell by lifting the pot. Right. If it's heavy, no water. If it's light, then it gets water. And the other thing that I think we meant, we didn't mention before is I'll just like do this to my houseplant every now and then to, to, to pretend like it's the wind because they do grow outside. I do touch them. I don't actually talk to them, but I do uh, touch them uh, so that they'll just move around a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see what's next. Okay. Okay. Um, the question is, um, what does one do about a drooping sansevieria? This is a sansevieria. I'm going to try to pick it up and put it here. It's got a flag in it. It should have a flag in the greenhouse. Um, this is a sansevieria. And um, the, the, this picture of the sansevieria, it looks very healthy to me because it's got... Um, the yellow stripe around the outside is very strong and very bright, which means it's probably getting enough light. Um, but the leaves are drooping. Um, these plants like to go for like a month without water. This is a Dracaena plant, type plant. And the Dracaenas hold water um, in their leaves, in the canes, wherever. So it does not need a lot of water. And my guess is this is getting too much water. It definitely needs um, some light, but it can grow in a low light situation. But this is getting good light because you can tell by the a nice yellow on the leaves. Um, it also, whoa, what happened? It also could be from repotting. Um, I don't think this was just repotted, but repotting can make the, the leaves droop a little bit. Um, and lack of humidity can also. This plant doesn't really need a lot of humidity, but if it's really, really dry, they can droop. And sometimes I think they just get heavy and they droop. But I would say this one is overwatered. Um, 
Yes? If they start twisting, is that a sign of something or that's natural? The leaves kind of turn. The question is, what if the leaves start turning like this leaf is doing? Mm -hmm. um, I would call that drooping. Um, and I would, I would say it's unhappy if it's doing that, which means it's either getting too much water or not enough water. And you really can't give these not enough water. So it's probably over water. Yes. Is there, uh, okay. is there a reason uh, that there's a kind of a mark there in the middle there uh, of the, your plant? Uh, uh, is there a reason why there's a mark on, on it's, yes. there's one here too. It's just uh, an accident. Something happened to bruise it and scrape it up. So it's not from watering. Or from I, watering. I don't believe so. I think it's mechanical uh, injury. This plant's really happy. See, it has a baby here. So it's got a root under the ground and the baby's growing right up out of the root. Yes? So um, I have a snake plant and it's got you know, maybe three plants in the pot and two of the leaves are like four feet tall and the rest of them are, are much smaller. Same age of the plant is what's going on there. So uh, she has a snake plant that has uh, three plants in a pot very tall, one is very tall, the others are small. My guess is it's a variety. Mm -hmm. Would you agree? I, I would agree. Would it help if you turn it? I mean, you know. Um, the question the is, would it help if you turned it? It always helps if you turn plants. Um, that won't keep it from doing this, but um, that way you have a nice balanced plant. That's mm -hmm. Okay, and then the next question is the Dracaena. This is a Dracaena, the next picture. Um, and it, it says corn plant, but that's not a corn plant. That's a Janet Craig eye or something. And um, the question is, why does it have brown leaves? Well, it depends what kind of brown leaves. Um, if it's crisp brown leaves, it's too much sun and not enough water. If they're mushy brown leaves, then it's too much water and not enough sun. These plants are low light. They have big strappy leaves, so they take in a lot of energy, so they don't need to be in real high light. You know, they don't need to be taking light in all the time, like a smaller plant would like this. So um, it looks like those are pretty crispy to me. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, uh, uh, that's one or the other. Yes. I have a question about the brown leaves. I have a example here. What would you think is the reason for this kind of browning on the leaf? The question is, what is the browning on her leaf? And I would say, until I got uh, is, is there a lot of browning on your leaves? Yes. Uh, this could be humidity or over fertilizing. Uh, lack of humidity. I'm sorry, I didn't say the question. Yeah. Well, you could show it with the camera. Yes. This is the leaf. What would you say, Cynthia? It, it could be, it could, you know, it, this is one of those, it depends on where it is, and it could be even um, too much sun. Could be sun. Where, where is it placed? So it was not close to the sun before. But now, up and started happening, I moved it more towards the sun. Okay. Mm -hmm. Did you get more brown leaves? More brown leaves. Oh, yeah, yes. sunburn yeah. then. Yeah. Probably. But uh, brown edges are lack of uh, humidity. I mean, it, there's a lot of things it could mean. Um, so you have to kind of look at what your, where your plant is and what it's not getting. Now, if you've moved into the light, we'd say sunburn. You know, many of these questions that we get, the answer, it, it depends. It depends on where it is, how much light, you know, water, uh, all of those kind of things. Uh, nothing to do with, m most of them not to do with sound that I know yeah. of. Yes. And then the last um, question is, how do I get rid of aphids on ficus or other indoor plants? It's pretty hard to um, get aphids inside unless you bring them in, as Cynthia was saying earlier. When you go, when you buy a plant, make sure it's clean. Sometimes we even leave them out, leave them isolated for a couple of weeks, make sure there's nothing on them. 
Um, anyway, so this plant is inside and it has aphids. So you would treat it like you would any other aphid outdoors, um, neem oil. What I would do with this plant if it's not too big is take it outside and squirt it off with a hose um, and get rid of the aphids. And then um, maybe even take a hand towel and clean the leaves and put some neem oil on and then take it back in. Um, maybe leave it outside for a little while. Yeah, make in the sure. summer, leave it yeah. out. Yeah. If you leave it out, the beneficial, if you have a good garden, you have a natural garden, beneficial insects will come and eat that. You don't have, you know, you don't have to worry about it. I, I do that with mealybug. If I get mealybug, I used to grow violets and oh my God, I used to get mealybug like crazy. And um, they'd get on my orchids. So I took all the orchids outside. I thought, I'm so frustrated. I said, everybody outside. And it ate all the, I, all the mealybug disappeared. So the beneficials ate it. Eat it. Yes. Um, how do I propagate the snake plants? The question is how to propagate a snake plant. Really pretty easy. You could just cut the, a tip off and put it in soil. Yes. True. You could even just cut it off here. Cut yeah. it off here. Yeah. Cut it and put it in soil. Very easy to propagate. The question is how to propagate a snake plant. How about the little one growing? How about the little one growing? Um, will that propagate? The problem is that's connected to the root. So you have to disconnect it from the root. Um, you could probably do. I I had a carefully. huge one before, and it it was like this was all filled up, and it was too crowded. So I actually was going to repot it anyway. And when I repotted it, you know, you everything is all tangled up in there with the roots. And so what I did was, um, you know, I just took my little snippers and snipped where, you know, it looked like it could be, um, you know, growing. And uh, then I had like three three plants. You know, I grow begonias. Um, I grow rhizome begonias. And um, they create these long rhizomes. And um, so I do the same. I just cut the rhizomes off and put them in soil and they grow, something grows out of them. I and think they, mainly don't be afraid to, yeah. to do all these things. It's like that Chef Lara. Don't be afraid to cut off those top branches and replant, uh, repot them. Yeah. yeah. It's like, how many plants have you killed? I've killed, oh, I could kill hundreds <laughs> of plants. Yeah. I have no idea how many plants I've killed. So but it was it, good. I like to experiment. I have a little greenhouse that I experiment in. I, you know, try, I'm going to try doing this. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Yes. Um, how do you get this? Uh, I think it's an anterior, this plant here. Yes. How do you get it to flower? Um, we're going to talk about anthuriums in just a minute, so I'll address all those things. Yes. Um, uh, aphid question. So, what is it? How do I tell if it's just a spider web or if it's a spider mite web? Like I, I keep reading online, but I can't really tell what it is. Spider mites are small. They're not, spider webs are big. But then, what if it's that just like a string from one leaf to the other? Is it just a spider or do I need to like? If it's like a spider web, it's probably just a spider. Right? spider yeah. If it's yeah. spider mite, and what I would do is I would take um, a piece of white paper and tap the leaf and see what you get. What color is it? I think it's black. Black. I think. I, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, that's a spider mite. Very minute. You'll just see some. Yeah, it's very minute. Yeah. That's why you put it on paper. They're very tiny. So if I can see it, it's not paper. Right. Okay. It's something else. Well, they are. Okay, they it, they it. do suck. They do suck the juice out of the plant. You don't want them. Got it. No, I I just have um, spider webs, but I'm not sure if it's spider mite. Or spider, just spider spider webs are much. Big. They're more meaty than a, a spider mite. It's just a little tiny insect. It's a little tiny web. It's not not big like a spider. Yes. So the corn plant is that the same corn that bears corn? That no. Is different. No. This isn't actually is is not a corn plant. A corn plant is as green and yellow, green with yellow stripes on the side. We'll have to reevaluate that slide. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it is not. It has nothing to do with corn. It just looks like a corn plant. 
because it's uh, it looks like a corn plant, but it's not related. Okay. Okay. Yes. On um, aphids, if they're outdoors and you just spray them, is that the same mm -hmm. as if they were indoors? I mean, in other words, will it work if you just spray them off? That's what what I do. And I don't get happen? overly excited about aphids. I know people do that it's like aphids on my plant. Oh my God, I don't want to do it. I just spray them off because you know what? A aphids are seasonal. They'll go away. As soon as it's summer, there's no more aphids. It's too hot for aphids. They'll come back maybe in the fall for a little blast, but that's it. Are those the ones that like on roses? You see them just you know, really populated. Again, if you have a clean, healthy yard, the beneficials will come in and eat your aphids. They eat mine on all my roses. I don't have aphids on any roses. I don't spray. I don't do anything. And, um, the, the ladybugs and soldier beetles eat them all. Ladybugs are, I guess, the best for beneficials. I understand you can combine them and then let them mm. fly in your... I think better garden. to have a healthy garden. You don't, you can't, the ladybugs that you buy... You don't, you know, you don't um, tag them that they live at your house. <laughs> they could go to the neighbor's house. <laughs> and then you spent all that money on something that's not, you know. Be you, yeah. So I'm so glad you have that because I had questions. My daughter's called so many strange thoughts. Any other questions before we go on? Okay. Okay. So now we're going to talk about um, how to propagate. Um, we didn't bring a monsteria in, but we don't need one. Monsteria. Um, the center picture is a monsteria. And uh, if you've been in Hawaii up to Hana or in a rainforest, you've seen these growing up trees. They're so lovely. They're an understory plant. They grow under the trees or on the trees. Um, and they're quite lovely in our home. I've had one for 38 years and um, I have done everything to keep that thing alive and healthy. And so now, I, again, I, uh, in the summer, I, my grandson and husband, this thing weighs about 50 pounds because it's in a huge container now and they take it outside and it loves it out there. I swear to it with the hose, it gets really, because inside you can't really soak a plant, if you know what I mean. You have to kind of be careful it doesn't leak on the floor and all that. Outside, squirt away. So um, to propagate it, it's easy. Um, there's a joint, uh, a node. I would pick from the top of the plant because the meristemic cells are in the, in the growing part of the plant, which is the top of the plant. And um, place it in a loose soil, perlite. Um, and you can see the brown roots. Those are soil roots um, on that plant. Those aren't water roots. And um, you will have a new monsteria. Um, a little information about monsterias. Um, let's see. Um, you can, it needs, uh, it's not a highlight plant, but it does need some indirect light. You can tell if it's not getting enough light because the leaves don't split. This is a split leaf philodendron. And um, if the leaves don't split, then you need to give it a little more light. And you need to give it some support. Um, and they also like being trimmed. I trim mine all the time, make it fuller. So that's how you propagate a philodendron. And then the next question is uh, spider plant, which is on the left. And these plants are the most easy things to propagate in the world. There's some over here that I won't walk over to, but they have they grow with roots coming out of them. The little um, uh, the little pups that come out, they have all have these roots on them, and um, you just stick it in a pot and you've got a new plant. I grow it outside. Oh, thank you. I didn't want to do that. Um, this one is just starting to get some roots. I think you can see it here, right here, and it'll grow. Um, very easy to propagate. So um, 
Again, I grow it outside. You need to be careful. I have mine in a pot uh, up on um, um, a wall and it hangs down. And sometimes it hangs into the flower bed and starts growing in there. So yeah. you have to be careful with these guys. Yeah, they, they can spread in the ground. Yes, they um, can. Two be five years to get rid of it. So the ZZ plant, how do we propagate a ZZ plant? Well, we have different choices. We could take a piece of the top and cut it and propagate it by stem. We can propagate it by leaf. This plant will propagate by leaf. Take the leaf off, cut the, cut the petiole off and stick it in the soil. It will grow and it also has, um, I believe there are rhizomes underneath that you can start. You could take it, you could take this out and divide it. There's rhizomes under there. This could be a plant and this could be a plant. So that's how you start a ZZ. Um, Did you find a string of pearls? No, I didn't. No string of pearls. Did you ask? No. Um, the next is how to keep a string of pearls alive. I was trying to find a sample, but my friend Kevin will try to find me one. I think you all know what a string of pearls is, succulent. It's a string. It's a succulent. It's a string. It has little round nodules like pearls. Are they kind of like dolphins? Pardon? No. That's string of dolphins. That's string it's of a, dolphins. It's a senesio as well. Yes. Yeah, different species. There's, there's string of hearts, um, string of pearls, and string of dolphins. And they're, some are variegated, some are not. They're all beautiful. Mm -hmm. And they're, to me, hard to keep alive as well. Oh, well, I, I don't have a problem. Do you grow them inside? I grow them outside, and I'm thinking mine get too much sun. Mm -hmm. I put them on my deck. I have them in pots with other succulents and they grow to the ground. I have them on the fence and I take them and I loop them around and they grow to the ground again and then I loop them around. Um, they, need, um, they need some light. Um, if they don't get the correct amount of lights, they go bald, all the little seeds fall off, all the little pearls fall off. If um, they shrivel, that means they're not getting enough water. The succulents do need water. They don't need to be drowned, but they do need water. They're not cactus, they're succulents. So um, that could happen. Um, yeah, so it, hopefully he'll bring us one. Yes. You're probably over watering. Are you going inside or outside? They really don't like growing inside. They really like being outside. Try putting them, do you have, are you able to put outside? And then bring it in, you know, if for, you know, a special occasion or. Again, it needs indirect sunlight, not direct. It doesn't want direct sunlight. It wants a filtered or, oh, just he brought of one, but this string is, of bananas. Bananas. There's, there's a little pearls. tiny string of pearls here. Just a string of pearls. It's a very pretty plant to have in your hanging pots. This is string of dolphins. Yeah, it doesn't look like bananas. <laughs> no. So thank you, Kevin. How do you propagate the string of pearls? Yeah. I'm sorry? How do you propagate the string of pearls? How do we propagate string of pearls? I just take it and jam a pearl into the ground and it works. Oh, one pearl? Just one pearl. One pearl. We can do two. I mean, it's like a node. I, I don't have any problem growing them. I grow the hearts. Um, I have some dolphins and I have a string of pearls. But I grow them all outside. Do I grow the string of pearls in full sun? No. It's in a, it doesn't get very much light at all. It gets light, but not direct light. Yes. Uh, I'm really glad you guys took this class, and I'm sorry I'm so happy about that. That's all right. Uh, my daughter has this wonderful habit of overwatering her house plants. They can look at my house until they're better, and then they go back to her house. <laughs> and I've been able to fix her, uh, maybe her fern, her rabbit's foot fern, but that darn asparagus fern is just, it, it's half of its dead and half of it's just like green. And I, I know she overwatered it, and maybe I'm not watering it enough. I just don't understand. Asparagus fern, like the asparagus fern that the birds <laughs> drop in your garden? 
Does it have thorns? There's different kinds of asparagus. Yeah, for it doesn't have thorns on it, but it has kind of thick, kind of, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, I grow that outside. And I can, I tried to get rid of it because yeah. it's aggressive. And I couldn't get rid of it. That's one thing I could not get rid of. Yeah. I, so I just cut it to the ground every year and just deal with it. Um, she's probably over watering it. Um, outside, it's in very well, good draining soil. And um, um, it dries out. Yeah, and maidenhair ferns, um, they require a lot of water and they really um, do not like light. To successfully grow them, grow them in the shade and water. Any other questions? Okay, we'll move on. I don't think this is mine. Okay, so uh, fiddle leaf uh, fig. Um, did anybody see that um, fiddle leaf over here? It's in the corner and it's been there for, I think, as, as long as we've been presenting here, like this is the third year. And it's like the right amount of sun and it hardly gets any water. So um, the, the question is, uh, what soil should I use to, um, to pot a fiddle leaf fig? How many of you all have that plant? They're beautiful, aren't they? And they're just so big and gorgeous. So a well-draining soil mix with a pH between 5.5 uh, and 7. And um, that could be a, a soil mix that contains uh, part cocoa guar, uh, perlite, and um, two parts organic soil. It needs some kind of nutrients in the organic soil. OK, so basically this this could be I, I know sometimes it's like what what cindy said mechanical you know if somebody bumps against it you might have this kind of um browning on the edge of the leaves but it, a lot of times most of the time again it's improper watering uh too much water uh or improper temperature if you have it close to a heater or an air conditioner we don't have air conditioning in Halfling bay but yeah mm -hmm. so but we do have heaters and I know that I had to move my daughter's um, fiddle leaf fig uh, and, it, and then it just went back into shape. And this one, if you get a chance uh, in, in this uh, room, it's a beautiful plant and, and I can't even believe the caliper on, on the big, on the, on the stems, mm -hmm. it's amazing, it's amazing. All right, uh, we need to move along here. So um, peperomias. I, I love peperomia plants. They have so many different varieties. You know, the little uh, round leaves, they have variegated leaves. I, for some reason, uh, got really, uh, really loving the peperomias. Um, so it says that uh, instead of being bushy and full looking, it has uh, petioles that are elongated so the plants look less full. I know that what happened to, in my own experience is um, it, did, it, was, it was in a place where it wasn't getting enough sunlight. So those leaves will stretch out and uh, try to reach for the sun. We were talking about the importance of turning your plants a lot. I placed, I replaced mine in a better spot. It liked it, uh, you know, right, what do we call it? Right plant, right, right space, okay. something like that. <laughs> uh, and, um, and, it did, uh, and it did very well. Uh, I can also tell you that sometimes these just get old and they are going to have yellow leaves and they do fall off. Um, I do repropagate every now and then. So every now and then I'll just prune a little bit and I'll, uh, um, you know, we talked a little bit about just uh, stem cuttings in soil and I'll just uh, replant it and then I'll put it back in the same pot and it still looks full. All right. And you have all the more detailed information on the slide if you, if, when, when you get your copy. All right. Um, okay, we're back to a ZZ plant. And I love this question when mm -hmm. we first got it. Uh, is it true that light, lightly wiping leaves with mayonnaise keeps them clean and healthy for longer? Okay, so how many of you remember back, maybe in fifth grade, I did teach fifth grade at one point in my life, and, and you learned about photosynthesis, mm -hmm. all right? And you know that your, your leaves are, are so important 
uh, to uh, bring in all the sun and, and expire, you know, transpiration uh, with, the, with the water and the sun and taking it in. So just common sense, no mayonnaise on your leaves. Actually, this, uh, they're, they're very, uh, if you can see this one even, this it's is, shiny this is one, I took this picture of, of my plant because it's just naturally that way. I haven't even dusted it for years. Ooh. And so I have it and it's just fine. You know, this is what it looks like. I don't know if I just don't have any dust in that area where it is. It's, it's in a corner where it doesn't <laughs> maybe get your dust. House. <laughs> yeah, it does. I do get dust, but not where that plant is. So yeah, because you close up the stomatas under the leaf and yeah. then it can't take in carbon dioxide and release oxygen. I, I don't know. I think that that's kind of like an old wives tale as well. And then, you know, like Cindy says, I do take it out every now and then and, and just take it out and, on my deck and just spray it with water and, you know, it's, it's all good. Okay, Cindy, Monstera again. Um, huh. Monsteras do like bright light. Um, this is a nice example, it's split and um, it's nice and bushy. Um, I have mine in a north facing window, but I have a skylight um, that gets up in the summer, gets afternoon sun. So it's quite bright in the corner. Um, so again, if the leaves don't split, um, it needs more light. And um, if its soil takes a long time to dry or the leaf coloration or it's growing slowly, it needs more light. Um, these guys are pretty hardy. They pretty much grow wherever you put them. Uh, they might not always look beautiful, but they'll grow. I mean, they'll live. Um, and like I say, if you keep them trimmed, they'll, they'll get a little bushier. They'll grow down below instead of up on top because they tend to want to grow all over, you know, the room. Yes. I always have a problem with the right size pot, I think. Um, so this one looks like a pretty big plant and a small pot. Is that the right proportion for this amount of soil needed for a size? So the question is, is the pot that this plant is growing in the right size? Um, it just depends on how many, how much roots are there. I would probably put that plant in a little bigger pot, personally. Um, the pot I have at home is a big, big pot that I grow mine in. Um, so in general, you know, this, this plant has air roots, mm -hmm. like orchids. Um, it has these hanging black, brown, not black, brown, hanging tendrils that are the, are the roots. And um, so those aren't in the pot. Those are just hanging out in the air. That's why I like to put it outside once a year and really spray everything, get those roots wet and give them some water. You can't do that in the house. Um, I take the air roots and I just stick it back into the soil. Is that, a, what, am I destroying the plant or? No. Okay. What happens when you do that? Nothing. Then you're doing on this, okay. But you shouldn't cut them off uh, because people are so neat and tidy. <laughs> they hate these things hanging. I mean, they hang, they're not really very pretty and they want to cut them off. Yeah. Just like people want to cut these roots off. This one doesn't have one, but if you have roots coming out of an orchid, people want to cut them off. No, they're roots. They need to be there, so. And plants, you know, you have to, plants are not considerate of your needs. So you have, um, I, uh, as an example, I'll just give you an example. When I was uh, a plant designer, um, I used to go into homes and place plants, design a plant layout. And um, I went to this one house in Atherton and I walked in and there, like, like in the corner over there, like in the corner there by that door was this gorgeous banana plant. Gorgeous, it was brand new, it was big leaves and it was just gorgeous there. So I walked in and I said, you know, that plant's not gonna do very well there because there's no light. And she says, oh no, that's where I want it. I was like, well, <laughs> it looks great there, you're right, but it's not gonna grow. You're, you just probably spent two or three hundred dollars on a plant that's going to die. So you have to do what the plant wants, not what you want. 
So a good segue into uh, sunny window. Oh, sunny window. Um, there's three types of light um, um, that you can give your plant. There's bright light, which is a southern or western facing. Uh, that would be ficus, the smaller leaf uh, type plants. Um, um, indirect would be an east facing window. Um, it gets morning sun. African violets like uh, east window quite well. Um, or it could be south facing, away from the window. So this plant here is in indirect light because it's not next to a window. And it's um, doing really very well. Um, it gets enough, the room is bright enough that it's getting enough light. It doesn't need to be right in front of the window. And then of course there's low light, which would be a north window. They have light meters that you can get. So you can you know, stand in a, where you think you want your plant and see how many, um, what the light is. And then when you go to the store to buy the plant and it says medium light, you could say, oh yeah, it'll work there. No, it's not gonna work there. Okay. So. Um, Cindy? Yes. Um, there's five minutes more for the presentation. Do you wanna continue with the slides or take questions? Um, are there a lot of questions on Zoom? Uh, so far, not. Okay, I think we're good. Yeah, go ahead. Um, we're almost done. Yeah, um, I'll go fast. Um, I have um, many plant house plants doing very well, but I have no luck with anthuriums. The leaves turn yellow. Um, I get one big brown spot in the middle of the leaf. It's probably turning yellow because you're overwatering it, <clears throat> and the brown spot is probably due to sunburn. Um, these plants like indirect light. Uh, they bloom quite nicely in our homes. I, I find that they don't really last for years and years and years. They last maybe a year, year and a half. Um, you should let the soil dry out uh, before watering them. Don't overwater them. Um, again, we see these in um, Hawaii and you know humid places. So it rains, they get wet, and then they dry out. The same with an orchid. It's the same care as an orchid, really. So, and if they get too much sun, they'll burn. Okay, so um, this is another question about low light plants. Uh, there's a ceiling light, but no windows. So this is related to what Cindy was just now talking about. And she's talked about good, good low light plants are a snake plant, which, which we went into detail. A cast iron plant uh, can get up to 24 inches tall, which is amazing to me. I don't have one of those. Um, a peace lily, you know, we all, that those grow very, very well, I think uh, in our in our area. Uh, Dracaena, and I was going to say something about uh, the, what used to be called Sansevieria, I think it's called Sansevieria transfasciata, and it is now called Dracaena transfasciata, which I thought was interesting because they looked at all of the DNA of a, a Sansevieria and they reclassified it as a Dracaena. So actually that's a Dracaena, now not a Sansevieria. Um, pothos, uh, we, there's all kinds of beautiful variegated pothos. Uh, I have a lime green one um, at home and just put, puts a lot of different kind of color. Uh, so all of these are low light conditions. Those pothos are pretty with, uh, you can plant them underneath like a big plant. You put them in the, you leave them in the containers and you put them around and it's quite pretty, you know, to dress up the container. And your pothos get really leggy if you just put them back. Yeah. Yes, and you can, um, you know, just re replant them. They're, They're just easy, around. really easy. Yes. Um, is there a way to get these lilies to your It needs more light. More yeah, more light. My, more I have one. I've had it for I don't know how many years. It's never bloomed. We're almost there. But I, yeah, I know it's light. Okay. Yes. Uh, what if I'm working with peach leaves to bloom in? Uh, use the water that you use to wash rice. Wash rice? Yeah, oh, rice and lentils. Mm -hmm. so well, there's all. In Asia, we use peach rice every day. So the water I, you know, that I collect from washing rice like three times, mm -hmm. I use that to wash for the plant. Well, if you think about what, what nutrients are in it. I mean, it's logical. It's all logical. Gardening is scientific. Yeah. So um, there's something in the rice water 
that it's the same as a fertilizer, some kind of component. You might have to look that up. And there's a million different, I, I online see, I, I can't believe all the different things I see, how to make plants grow, like put a, the orchid tips in the water, ice cubes, all that, no. Right. We, we see a lot of things. That's another thing that master gardeners do. We are research-based. So most, most of our information comes uh, you know, a lot from our experience, but it is also research-based. So if we have an experience, we also uh, double check it to make sure we're imparting uh, research-based knowledge. All right, last one, Hoya. Who has Hoya curtsii? Um, and are you, are you uh, does it bloom once a year or maybe a couple of times a year? Mine is outside. Um, it says it's in an east facing window that gets a lot of sun in the spring and summer. What I know is that I keep mine outside and I keep it, you know, it gets bright and direct light all year round and it blooms twice a year. So, mine does too, I have mine outside. Yeah, and it's such a thrill when these beautiful blooms, I took these pictures from mine this last year and it's such a, when they, and the other thing is don't uh, cut, uh, pull off those little blooms when they dry up, leave them on the stem because another one will bloom in the same spot next year. All right. Um, we've talked about corn plants, so we're, since we're almost out of time, um, it's the water, filtered water for house plants. Don't grow avocados by seeds. It'll never get an avocado. Yeah. <laughs> you need to have that A and B or whatever yeah. self-pollinating. Okay. Buy, a, buy a little plant at the nursery. Wait, I don't know avocado. why this is not advancing. You're, you're advancing for me. Yeah. Um, give it lots of water. It needs lots of water almost every day. Your bonsais, if you choose to buy a bonsai. And they should be grown outdoors. Yeah. So I have a bonsai. We keep it outdoors. If we're having a party or something, we'll bring it indoors to show it off. Mm -hmm. But uh, keep your bonsais outdoors because they are trees. And that's a juniper, so that would not grow indoors. We can just skip, skip that one. And um, there's our master gardener. Uh, we have a, uh, how about the next one? We want to thank the San Mateo Arboretum for hosting us. We really enjoy presenting here. And, and you all have been a lovely audience as been on Zoom as well. And uh, our last slide is um, we have a Master Gardener uh, helpline. So if you have any kind of gardening questions or houseplant questions, uh, you can look up, um, uh, you'll have this, uh, this information uh, and you can actually email pictures or ask questions online or even telephone in. And I would like to say once a month, there's a plant clinic here. It's not on there, shame on them. But we have a plant clinic here, and you can bring your uh, troubled plants in a plastic bag, uh, cutting, and we will try to answer your questions. And you all have been a wonderful audience. Thank you. Would you like your leaf back? <laughs> oh, she's done. <laughs> I'll put it here. The next um, plant clinic will be on Sunday, July 7th. The same day as our next seminar. So thank you, Cindy and uh -huh. Cynthia, for that excellent presentation. And so you much, are welcome. So much great information about There's how so to much keep to our talk about house plants healthy. A lot to talk about. Yes. I, took, I took a lot of notes. Okay. In a few days, you will be emailed a link to a recording of the presentation and an evaluation form. Any unanswered questions can be addressed at that time. We appreciate feedback on what worked and where we can improve and uh, what programs you'd like to have, see us have in the future. Please join us for our next seminar. Uh, it'll be on Sunday, July 7th. Uh, California Native Gardening for Year-Round Interest in Color with Jennifer Durkin. She's fabulous. I heard her talk about two months ago and I said, can you come and speak to us? And she said, yes. So you register at San Mateo Arboretum dot org slash classes and events. You can become a member of the Arboretum Society and re receive a discount on workshops at a variety of nurseries and businesses on the peninsula. And of course, a 10% discount on our nurse at our nursery. The Arboretum Society also has a variety of volunteer opportunities in the greenhouse and nursery and much more. Let us know if you're interested by uh, completing the evaluation form, or you can email us at info at sanmateoarboretum.org. 
And a huge thank you again to Cindy and Cynthia and uh, for today's program. Kevin, our president, for uh, handling the technical part of the program, and to all of you for joining us today. The program is now finished. Thank you. 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 You're a great audience. Good question.